Welcome to a new video in my home automation series and today I'm going to review this uh, Zigbee smart switch. This also came from Mumubiz. Uh, it was supplied free of charge for this review video and uh, it is very similar to another product which I reviewed recently which is this one. So this is a single channel Zigbee switch. The difference between these two is well, the similarity is that it can be powered using low voltages, so AC or DC 7 to 32 volts, or basically just a micro USB. So that's the same between the two devices. They both use Zigbee, and they can be also paired with a regular 333 MHz RF key fob. But this has only a single output, and this has two or dual outputs. And because it has all the relay outputs here, this is ideal to be used for low power devices or for example as a garage door opener or controlling some other devices which require a dry contact output. Let me just cover the unboxing. So this device comes in this uh, fairly generic box which just says, you know, smart switch and it, you know, supports, well there is an EV-Link app or a logo here. But, um, you know, because this is Zigbee, that's going to work with EV-Link and TUI as well. So I'm going to show you how you use in both of these ecosystems. And it comes with a user manual. It's a very simple leaflet, which in one side is English and on the other side it is, uh, I'm guessing it is Chinese. And you can actually see a model number. So ZG2001 and ZG2001RF. You can see the inner workings here and the wiring diagram, but I'm going to open this up so we can see how it works. And then it, go, it goes through a couple of steps, how you set it up in the two app and how you pair the RF key fob with it. And I'm saying RF key fob here, but just keep in mind that there are many different live switches available uh, that also use the RF. So they look like regular light switches, but they battery operated and they use, you know, don't require wires. So you can just stick them on your wall using sticky tape and then you can pair it with this device. So that's uh, going to be quite nice. And I think I'm going to go ahead and open this unit. So you have the terminals on both ends. So you can see the input and you can see the output here. And you just have to lift these covers uh, to get access to these terminals. And there are clips on both sides. So you just need a screwdriver to open it up. And the same with the other side as well. And actually I'm going to lift the main cover as well because this is, you know, operated by DC. It's going to be safe for me to use that. Um, you know, I'm not going to connect anything to the output uh, for this video. So this is all going to be operated using, you know, low voltages. So it is safe to remove the cover for this demonstration. And of course, normally you don't have to remove this cover. You just have to remove the end pieces. But you can see the inner workings here. And uh, as you can see on one side, this is the input. You can feed in a micro USB so you can power it from, you know, let's say five volts, a power bank or any wall adapter. You also have the two screw terminals here. So you can use it for, as you can see here, AC, DC 7 to 32 volts. So any, if you have any device which has a built-in power supply, most probably you can use that power supply. So as I said, with a single channel relay, uh, the example would be that if you have some simple LED strips that are, you know, not RGB, not color controlled, some simple light, uh, sorry, simple white LED strips that are operated from either 12 or 24 volts, you can use the power supply to drive this unit. And also on the output, you can control your LED strips. So you don't need a separate power supply for that. In terms of the power, I just want to have a small comment. Uh, I think there is a small design flow in this board because if I put the board, if you want to put the board back into the case, well, the, it's, it's not really going to fit. So first of all, you can see that there are some clearance issues here with the USB plug. And this is not a particularly fat USB plug. So I don't think that you will be able to find anything which is smaller than that. And not to mention that even if I would be able to push this in, there is not enough recess here on these end caps for them to go in without, you know, being blocked by the USB plug. So I think this is like a, a, a bit of a design flow 
well, probably it's not a design flow, but they just use a commercially available case. And they just said, well, if somebody wants to use the USB, they will probably remove it from the case and operate it without that. But of course, if you have, if you want to use the DC jack input, you should be able to root the wires outside. So this is going to, you know, go on like this and you still have enough space for the wires to exit. And on the other side, on the relay side, you just have the normal relay output. It is not really labeled here. Uh, which, well, definitely the middle one is going to be the common for each of the relays. And then one would be the normally open and the other one would be the normally closed connection. And the only indication which one is the normally open is in the manual. So it says that the, you know, the outer uh, pin is the normally open so that's how you would connect a mains let's say a lamp to it so I've already shown you how you can use the two buttons to operate the relays and there is a third button as well which, which is used to switch in between modes and it supports three different modes so the first mode is this one where you operate the relays individually so you press on once the relay comes on and you press again and the relay uh, goes off and then if you press the mode button once, then it goes into the alternate mode. So you turn on one relay and it stays on. You can turn it off. So it is same as the, you know, the other mode. But if you turn the other relay on, the first one turns off. So you can use this as, let's say, a blind motor where you either operate the blind up or down. So this is, let's say, the up position. And when you click down, obviously the up uh, output turns off and the done uh, output turns on. So as you see, ideal for a, a blind motor. And if you press the mode again for uh, uh, just short press it, then it becomes, it goes into momentary mode or both of the channels. So you turn it on and it automatically turns off. And if you do it again, the second relay comes on and it goes off automatically. So this would be like, for example, if you want to use it for a garage door opener, which only needs a short impulse, you can do it like this. You have to pick these modes for both of the outputs. So you can't have one of them on momentary and the other one on temporary. So I, if I change again, now you can see that it's back to the original mode. And the third use of this button, if you long press on any of the output buttons, then as you can see now it is in pairing mode. So I'm going to pair button D. And now you can see I can operate that output using the key fob. And if I do the same for the other button, so if I long press for the second output, I just wait for the blue light and I can pair it with the key fob. So now, I can operate it from RF as well. Hmm, very simple. Now, as you can see, the red LED is flashing, which means that this device is ready for pairing with a Zigbee hub. And first, I'm going to use the Tuya app. And in the Tuya, I'm going to use my Blitzwolf Zigbee gateway. And it's called, well, the, the number is BWIS1. And I know that this device is no longer sold. There is a replacement product, which is uh, BWIS10, but it works exactly the same. It just looks uh, slightly bit different from the outside. So you do the pairing first. I've done a separate video on how you do that. And then you come to this screen and you click on add sub device. You make sure that the LED is blinking, which it does. And now we just wait for this device to be discovered by the Zigbee hub. And we just have to wait a little bit longer. Okay, and now we have one device successfully added. And I'm going to just uh, rename this Mumu Bees. And I'm going to call it Jewel because it has two outputs. And I'm going to put it into my living room. So if I exit, I go into the living room. And probably I just have to wait. Oh, it's here. Mumu Bees Duo. It's at the bottom of the list. And we just wait for the screen to load and we have two outputs. So as you can see, I can operate them from here. So you can't switch different mode on the app. You, always, you have to use this button to change it to, you know, latching or, or alternative mode. Uh, and then, you know, it's just going to work accordingly from the app as well. But, you know, in the default mode, which is the regular like latching mode, you have the two buttons here and you can just turn them on and off. You can give different names for the individual switches. So you would know which one you are switching. 
and uh, you also have a timer. So let's say now I have turned on both of my outputs. So you can see both of them are on. And let's say on switch one, I want to add a timer. Then after 10 minutes, I want this output to be automatically turned off. Oops. Off. And I want to do it once. So this is a simple timer which says that now I have manually turned this one on, I enable this timer, so this would automatically turn off. This is like a sleep timer functionality that you have on the TV. And you can do this separately from each of the channels. And when you go into the setup, you can do just general maintenance of this uh, uh, device. You can change the icon, you can change the name and the location, and uh, you can create multi-control association. So if you have multiple of these switches and you want them to work together, you can create them into, you can link them into a multi-control group. So you turn on one, the other one would also turn on automatically. Since I have just one, I can't really demonstrate that. And you can share the device with the, you know, other users. But that's pretty much it. So that's the functionality that you get on the let's say on the device screen as well. So let's see what we can do in automation. I don't expect to be anything special after all, this is like a smart switch. So we can definitely create automation based on either channel one or channel two is getting turned on or off. So if I select when the device status changes, Momobis Dual, and as you can see, I can create automation if switch one is getting turned on or turned off, or switch one is getting turned on or turned off. So that's simple enough. And of course, I should be able to control this device from an automation. So if I set this automation up for a tap to run, I can select, let's say, run device and the Moomoobies. And let's say I can say that I want to switch off channel one. So you have the option to switch it on or off or actually toggle the state, which is, which is quite nice. It could be useful for a couple of scenarios. And then let's say I'm going to turn this one off as well. So I have an automation that, well, it's a simple automation. It's the, you know, launch tap to run automation that if I do that, then it's going to turn off both of the outputs, which it does. It took a little bit more time than I expected. So that's how you would control this device from the to your smart application. And now, as you can see that the status LED is blinking again because I've removed this device from Tuya. So it is ready to be paired with another Zigbee hub. And now I'm going to use EV-Link and there I'm going to use the son of uh, Zigbee Bridge. And I'm going to pair this device with a Zigbee Bridge. The process is going to be the same. You come to the Zigbee Bridge uh, page or the device page and you are going to click add. And by the way, I have done a separate video of how you use the Zigbee Bridge and how you set it up. So you can watch that if you don't have that up and running. So the device is already found and I can just add it to my devices. I think I'm going to rename that. Yeah, so you have um, in EV-Link, uh, the device gets random name, but I immediately have, you know, channel one and the channel two. Well, they are already on. So you can control them from here as well. And if I go into the device screen, I also have these controls here and I have, you know, channel one and channel two, I can rename them. Here on the EV link, we have a button to turn all of them on or all of them off. So we can do it from here. And similarly, how we have seen for the single channel device, oops, which I have here, you can create schedules. So you can create schedules separate on channel one and channel two. Let's say I want the channel one to automatically turn on at 10 p.m. And uh, let's say I want that to happen, you know, these days of the week and the action should be on and it should be on channel one. So now every 10 a.m. Uh, on those days that I've selected, the channel one is going to turn on. And you can create multiple of these schedules for each of the channel. So this is like, you know, the, the, you know, the programmable cycles that you have with, uh, uh, even with, you know, non-smart uh, uh, relays or sockets as well. The other function is the timer. So I have now, you know, both of the channels on, so I can create a timer. So this is like a one-off timer. So for example, after 30 minutes, I want, my channel two to turn off and I enable this and now I just have a 30 minutes timer. So this is going to work now. If I want to use it again, I would need to go through this uh, 
you know, set up again in the future as well. So it's like a, like a sleep timer that you have on the TV. And that's pretty much it. If I go into device details, I can rename the device. So let's say now I'm going to give it Mumubi's Dual, just like before. And then I can also rename the various channels. So just give them a specific name, similarly how we have seen in the uh, Tuya app as well. And I can assign it to a different room. And um, uh, yeah, now I have to find it again because it moved to a different room. If I go back to the details, that's it. And in the logs, you can see, you know, who changed the device on and off, whether it was uh, uh, from a user from the EVLink app or whether it was triggered, for example, by pushing the button or pushing the key fob. So that's what the, the logs shows and the log shows the IDs. So if you share this device with anyone else, then obviously their ID is going to show up in the log. So you can tell who operated that device. So that's what you get in the device settings screen. Let's look at the automations. So if I want to create a scene, as with any smart device, you can create a trigger, whether any of the outputs are either turned on or turned off. So in the triggers, if I click add and smart device and dual, you can see that for you know channel one or channel two, you can have an action, sorry, a trigger, either when it's getting turned on or turned off. And you can actually do the same as well on the action side. So if something, something else happens on another device, you can actuate the relay. So you can, for example, turn the, oh, sorry, sorry, novice mistake. You can't use the same device in the condition and in the uh, action as well. So I have to go out from here, confirm, and uh, just look at the actions smart device and then now I have the Moomobis Dual in the list and as you can see I can set up the action both on channel 1 and channel 2 and I can see whether I should want to keep that or turn it on and off. So for example here uh, when this uh, trigger, when this automation triggers then channel 1 is going to turn off and channel 2 is going to remain as it is. You don't have a toggle option here like you have in, uh, in the Tuya Smart app. So it has to be either on and off. And I think that should conclude my review of this Moomobis Dual Zigbee and RF switch. If you are interested in this product, you are going to find uh, purchasing links in the video description. But that will be all for today. Thanks for watching and hopefully see you in the next video.